Shakyamunaya Buddhaya. Dear Sangha, today is the 5th of March, 2023. A few days ago, the brothers, the monks, who received the full ordination from Thailand, they came back and they showed me some photos of the precepts uh, transmission ceremony. They show me those photographs. Dear friends, I have a few opportunities to follow uh, big ceremonies, great activities in uh, the Buddhist community. But in the Plum Village uh, tradition, I follow them quite closely because I learn a lot about the culture of Plum Village, the way the young monks and nuns organized. At first, I couldn't believe that a center uh, born recently in Thailand compared to the, our center in uh, France, in uh, the U.S., in uh, Europe. So Plum Village, Thailand, is just was just born after uh, the incident with Prajna Monastery. It was established in 2010, and yet now it is known as the nursery. Uh, Vương Um, just like uh, the Thai and the monastics gave that name, the uh, the nursery Plum Village, Thailand, because it's that's where we plant seeds, and it's very strong. And this is a place that we have very beautiful uh, activities, uh, ceremonies. I have observed uh, the uh, precepts transmission ceremonies in. Uh, friends in Deer Park and most recently in Thailand, I can see that it's very uh, pure. It doesn't have like these uh, luxurious, like uh, fancy uh, parts like greeting the government officials like in some traditions and have long lengthy speeches. So that's the first thing I noticed that we don't have. Uh, in the past, the Buddhist uh, community, we had ceremonies that did not mix, um, that follow the worldly way. They don't means we follow the, uh, it's a, it, it mixed with the worldly culture to please the government officials. And it cost, you know, it cost a loss, of, uh, a loss of money and also it takes up and take away these Zen activities that are quiet and solemn. Also, the it, the ceremonies can be just too lengthy, too showy, to demonstrate more than the, uh, the content. Thirdly, some ceremonies in uh, the Buddhist community now as general, it can be very noisy and it takes away something very beautiful, very solemn and tranquil. Uh, what people think that they think that is so good that to have MC. Master of Ceremony, we think that, oh, we have menses that uh, will interject in activities. They talk about all sorts of things. Uh, if we don't have those kind of speech, that kind of speech, people uh, cannot, uh, don't, don't feel comfortable. And it seems that it happens in so many ceremonies like that. And then we... Uh, the, the the solemn the solemnity of a of, of a ceremony is affected by uh, the presence of singers. They sing and they dance. It doesn't look proper, and yet people like to go in that direction. And so, what we look at our Plum Village tradition, even though the monks and nuns are still young, but the organization of these ceremonies is uh, very beautiful. And I observe these uh, precept ceremonies. I see that they are very pure, very um, solemn, peaceful. And this is a transmission uh, from this Buddhist uh, lineage. 
it's not just from Plum Village, not from the monks and the nuns, not something our teacher created, but this is a recovery. Um, this Buddhist tradition um, that has a long history of this in the way the Buddha, if we follow the teachings of the Buddha recorded in Bali canons. It's very beautiful. The monastic culture is very beautiful. Uh, in a, a Back then, in the, um, early, the first century or earlier, they had Buddhist institutes that had more than um, 2,000 monastics. And the king, De Luli, he he violated uh, a, a very big crime. He uh, he committed patricide. He killed his father to become a king. But then when he met the teachings of the Buddha about cause and effect, and then he uh, he he gave rise to remorse, and he was determined to meet the Buddha to change his karma, his action. And so a close... Um, official brought him to the king and when he the king stepped in this space of 1250 monastics the king was frightened and he he felt he was trapped he was tricked uh, because with a number of a great number uh, of people like that, more than a thousand people, and you you uh, you don't even hear a cough, you don't even hear a sound. It's unbelievable. And he was afraid that he was trapped. And but his uh, uh, close official said, "No, don't worry. The the monastics they are doing sitting meditation. So when we come." Once they, once we enter the meditation hall, the Buddha and the monastics will be done, and then they can greet you. And it was like that when he stepped in, and then the monastic sangha was done with the sitting meditation, and he said, he was very impressed by the great number, and yet this deep silence. So the beauty, beauty of a center is not about the noisiness, but it's um, quietness, peace, peacefulness, and most beautiful in uh, be most beautiful thing in a ceremony. It's not about the master of ceremony talking about all sorts of things, but but to cause noise from the beginning to the end. This is very unskillful. This we fail to learn from the uh, cultural uh, way, uh, the Buddhist culture, the way we learn from the Buddha. So when I observe the, pre uh, the ceremonies like the precepts transmission uh, ceremony or the or Vesak, and I have respect for the young monks and nuns who have organized these ceremonies. They are not very old, but they are able to organize ceremonies that carry this Buddhist tradition culture in, in such a way, in such a beautiful way. Also, uh, something maybe late friends we you don't know yet, that even though after the the like the earthquake of sorts of uh, you know when our monastery in Vietnam uh, was uprooted the monastics were evicted and that's how we established uh, our center in Thailand and I heard that our our teacher said in the southern tr transmission we had the. Um, the the, the Bhikshuni Sangha means the community for the for the for the nuns. But I don't know how have the monks how have the monks uh, been that uh, the Bhikshuni Sangha vanished uh, since uh, since then. And so in many Asian countries, they are not like in Thailand, in Cambodia, in Laos, uh, in. Um, uh, Bhutan, oh no, I, not anymore. There, there, are, there are Asian countries. They don't have the nun sangha, and they can only receive women can only receive uh, eight precepts and not the novice precepts. So they are not fully ordained bhikshunis. They cannot attend the monastic uh, community of the Buddha. 
Meanwhile, in the past, in India, at the time of the Buddha, the Buddha opened the doors for the women to become uh, fully ordained, and they also attain arahatship. They attain enlighten enlightenment. In the time of the Buddha, so when we read the recordings of the teachings of the Buddha in the Mahayana uh, sutras, and uh, uh, we see that there are many, there were many fully ordained monk uh, nuns who had uh, who attained, uh, uh, you know, uh, for enlightenment. They were they had equal. Uh, They had uh, high levels of attainment, uh, not any less than the monks at their time, in their time. And yet, the his, with the historical events, when the Buddhism disappeared uh, in Buddhism um, uh, in India, then Buddhism moved to other countries um, in uh, in other Asian countries. Then slowly, the Bhikshuni Sangha also vanished. They were not um, continued. And so what I heard from the brothers and sisters, um, I did not hear our teacher Thay uh, say it directly, but I heard it. Uh, and Thay said that when we built centers in in Asia, like in Thailand, Thay wants to, Thay wants to give the gift uh, to this country that is a bhikshuni sangha in Thailand. And so this is something sounds simple, but when we look at the Thai culture or other uh, southern, uh, other Asian countries in the south, it, it may cost them another 100 years uh, for them to reestablish the Bhikshuni Sangha. And they, they cannot build a Bhikshuni Sangha for the Thai people. And yet, we cannot. If we cannot do that, if we cannot build a bhikshuni sangha of Thai uh, people, then with certainty, the Thai culture they respect men and not women. Then they uh, cannot. Um, they will not be able to establish a bhikshuni sangha anytime soon. And if we are uh lucky to have a center with the elder venerable nuns to begin a uh, a center then it will be a great blessing for Thailand you know that in to exchange a to have a development uh like Thailand um, they receive a lot of losses they suffer a lot of losses the destruction of their culture of of their environment uh, of a buddhist tradition that uh, you know, that was more than a thousand years and statistically people said there's no country that in that they can have problem with sexual vi violence or a sexual misconduct uh, happen like in Thailand the the women the men they they also they had to they had uh, like operations on the sexual organs so that they can do these shows um If there were a practice center, uh, if we have a uh, bhikshuni sangha to 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 be a, a great culture, it can save so many people. Um, we think we may think simply that uh, the social activities develop. They don't need the presence of a like of the Buddhist community, but that is not true. Buddh Buddhism, the presence of Buddhism, is a great gift uh, to humanity to rebuild our uh, ethical values, and we the presence of our practice centers can help people uh, save them from a lot of of suffering in their daily life. So what our teacher said, he wants to. Uh, give a gift to Thailand by rebuilding the Bhikshuni Sangha fully ordained uh, uh, community for the nuns. Um, that is something that is very great. And the Thai community, they may be very uh, hesitant. They have not uh, re, uh, come to the monastic path. Uh, 
in great number yet. So it's still waiting for. Uh, it it depends on the young our young brothers and sisters who learn uh, Thai and they be become um, you know uh, gr wonderful teacher so that they can spread the Dharma and also it's important that they also have uh, like high degrees in order to to spread the teaching because because in Thailand Buddhism is their national religion uh, we we have we have we don't just practice and enter the society we have to have high honor in in the oldest institute in Thailand in order to have a chance to carry out his uh, wish is to give Thailand a, a, a great gift, and that is a bhikshuni sangha in Thailand. Meanwhile, what's strange that in the past, past the Bhikshuni Sangha already existed from the time of the Buddha, when the Buddha was alive, the discrimination uh, between men and women seemed did not uh, did not exist like now. Like after that, when it went to countries like uh, China, like Korea, like Japan, Vietnam is uh, a little less uh, discriminative because we do have bhikshuni sanghas. Um, but but the the tradition the, of respecting the men and not the women is still very strong in many cultures and it, and it will take a lot of work to remove this discrimination even in this worldly life in our daily activities it seems that the modern civilization uh, and it's true in all different stra strata of uh, society. Um, in the Vietnamese uh, 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 culture, still they respect the men more. The men carry the uh, gr greater responsibilities in the family. They are seen as the head of the family. So it's not just Vietnam, but it's true in Europe. It's you true in America. Uh, but when we, it's just lighter or you know, more um, or heavier. The the, but when we look at the at the the the, uh, the recordings, and we see that the time of the Buddha, the princesses, even the uh, the cooks, the housewives, even the prostitutes, or those who had been married, but when they met the, the Buddha Dharma, then they, then they all receive, a, they all were capable of receive enlightenment. When they had the, uh, the, 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 the energy of the practice, then they attain enlightenment in their own rights. And so attaining enlightenment, uh, our hardship has no discrimination between men or women, age, group, or uh, high class or low class. There is no differences if you practice if you have uh, uh, enthusiasm enthusiasm if you uh, touch you develop deep wisdom then you are able to attain enlightenment so in the recorded teachings of the buddha there are very wonderful sutras and one i read this morning there was a bhikkhu with the name soma Bhikkhu is a fully ordained monk, and he, after he went on his arms round, he came back, and after he, uh, uh, Bhikshuni, before she, uh, she, uh, after she finished her meal, she chose a tree and sat down to do sitting meditation, and there was this monster came, said that this is the to achieve enlightenment, it takes a great, it takes a great mind. With the great, with as a woman with small mind, how can you achieve enlightenment? And when you hear this a monster, you think it's some kind of monster with the blue face or with the fangs or anything. That could be a, just a man. 
It could be just anybody in society because the form, we can carry a human, but the mind may not be of a human. It's not noble. So don't think, oh, you know, these monsters uh, uh, can be full of discrimination. But when you understand this, then you see that in the human society right now, It can have. It still happens. Don't think um, this monster. It has to look like a monster to be a monster. So this Bhikshuni, she was quite strong herself, and then she thought, "Who's saying this? Maybe this is not a human being. Could be this. Be could be a devil, something evil. So let's uh, us understand this." When you say that's not a human being, it means that somebody with moral, uh, more with uh, ethics, uh, with uh, great virtues. You can be beautiful, uh, looking beautiful, but it could be the mind of of the devil of the smart. And so she responded. When the mind is skillfully in meditation, the female form has no obstacles there to uh, to touch to achieve the the path. She made a very long gatha to let the other person know that men or women there is no obstruction. When you can focus your mind in meditation, in concentration, when you are wholehearted in your practice, when you have enough conditions to learn the Buddha Dharma, and when you have the the strength to enter uh, deep looking uh, a contemplation, then when. So when this monster heard this, it was uh, embarrassed and it left. It was embarrassed, so it it, it walked away. So this is a, a teaching. It shows that at the time of the Buddha, the the discrimination that was there, even amongst towards uh, the venerable nuns. So when she passed away, she was buried in the area that the Buddha. Uh, in the area the Buddha practice, and not somewhere else outside. And many bhikshunis, fully ordained nuns, I read in this Bali uh, Canon. Um, I couldn't bring all of them with me, so I didn't bring these Bali Canons. This um, this in bhikshuni was very interesting. She was uh, she had been a wife of a very wealthy man. And this wealthy man, one day after he listened to the teachings of the Buddha, he gave rise to the mind of practice. And then, as a uh, her, uh, her as a wife, uh, she she performed her duty. She took off his robe, held his hand, walked him in the door, and so she showed her respect to her husband. That was the way they had to behave. This is my owner. Both my Husband and my uh, my uh, my uh, owner, and I'm only a maid. That's how it was in the Indian culture. The wife is only, and so when he she held his hand, she he he took his hand away, and she was worried. She said, "What happened? What happened?" Well, she she was worried the way he treated her, and then he brought she brought out a food for him. He said, "No." And then he, she brought him the handkerchief, and she said, he said no. And so, and so modestly, she said, today, uh, did I do, uh, do I, did I do anything unskillful that my husband, my owner, uh, uh, mistreat me like that? And then he said that, uh, to be honest with you, today I learned the teachings from the Buddha, so I'm not the same man anymore. I want to respect you as somebody like myself, and not as my a maid. I'm not your owner anymore. And from today on, one, you can go home to your. Parents, if you want, or you can get married to somebody else. I, I do not have. You don't have any bondage, uh, to me anymore, and so I don't control you anymore. And she said, "It's not that simple. How can you return me to my parents? 
Uh, why would I get remarried? If you can touch the Buddha Dharma, then why wouldn't I practice? I would want to practice myself. But I cannot go to the centers of the Buddha by myself. So you have to take me there to meet the the fully ordained nuns there. So he actually respected that, and he brought her to a um, to a, a nuns uh, community, and and Maha Gotama, who was the actually the auntie, and um, who who took care of the Buddha since he was born, since his mother passed away. And so she was the the most venerable nun there. And so she accepted this woman, and not very long, not even. Within one year, she attained four stages of uh, jhana, of meditation. She, and she, what another, she did, the, the, uh, she, she can give Dharma talks like the rains, like the clouds, means like she achieved eloquence. And her teachings were true with the, uh, the right Dharma, and she could help people to go into the practice to attain, attain enlightenment themselves. And fourthly, uh, she, she could uh, uh, debate with however uh, versed um, the Brahmins were, and they she could debate with them and, and and crash all of their arguments. So this was a Bhikshuni who was in her midlife already, and she was able to re, uh, attain this thân tuệ, I mean the 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 the, the wisdom of a an arahat of a saint, and he, she was able to have eloquence uh, equivalent to Venerable uh, uh, Fulona. He was known for his eloquence. So the gathas, the poems left behind by the most venerable nuns that they uh, were able to achieve high they actually, their gathas were three times more than the monks. I don't know what happened. Those uh, <laughs> bhikshunis, they, they did so well. Even the, the fully ordained monks didn't leave as many poems. So when you read this, I'm not adding this. I'm not making it up. So I'm telling you these two stories. The, uh, the, the elder nuns, from the time in the time of the Buddha, when he opened the Dharma door and he taught the the he, he spread the teachings in India, his in his community there was no discrimination uh, between men and women, uh, and also no nobody uh, has less uh, capacity to practice. The question is whether you practice or not. That's the importance. You understand the Dharma and you practice deeply or not. So attaining our hardship is not reserved for some only a small group of people who are elite or who are men. Uh, um, but this is a gift. Uh, offer to everybody in the world, men, women, young, old, uh, high positions in society as kings or uh, queens or people who are killers, um, like Angulimala, he was, who was a serial killer in the time of the Buddha, and prostitutes uh, like Am uh, Ampali uh, in the time of the Buddha. So if we practice, we understand we uh, the Buddha Dharma, and we practice wholeheartedly, then we can attain this uh, a high, the, the the wisdom of the of the arahat. I keep looking at the clock. <laughs>
I'll stop by 11. The second thing I'd like to share with the Sangha is that I just talked about the first issue is about the culture of discrimination and to affirm that the time of the Buddha, he, he, the, his, his community did not have discrimination uh, uh, towards men or women or the, towards uh, enla enlightenment, uh, attaining the highest level of the practice. It's what's most important is whether we can understand and practice wholeheartedly the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, the second thing is that there's a very interesting uh, sutra discourse taught by the Buddha um, that I didn't bring the, the book with me. I just remember a short excerpt uh, for enough for you to practice. And uh, that's a sutra with the name, Is There Any Dhammadoa? Um, I think this is the easiest sutra. I have read it many times. I try to remember it my, uh, by heart. Uh, it's not uh, in, uh, pro, in verse, so it's difficult for me to remember. Uh, so this, uh, so it is the foundation of our uh, the mindfulness of uh, of the the four establishments. So it's this uh, the foundation of achieving the highest level of attainment. And so this, uh, this all of these centuries that uh, of the Buddhist practice, it is not to build, to help somebody to, de to become noble or to have enough virtues in the world to be respected by the world. Uh, the teachings of the Buddha is not to only to help us to build our field of merit so that when we die, we can be reborn in a Buddha land uh, or, uh, or, or to become uh, gods in the heaven. Uh, but the teachings of the Buddha is offered to each living being, the, the stream of true wisdom so that we can taste this uh, uh, stream of uh, true wisdom and you can realize uh, realize of true full enlightenment and not just the small things like we we want um, and so in this sutra I said is there any Dharma door so one day the Buddha called uh, the venerable Shariputra uh, the Buddha said Shariputra do you know if there's a, a Dharma door that you do not need faith you do not need to study. You do not need to practice asceticism. You don't need to debate for uh, the five, six uh, characters, uh, characteristics. I just one is faith that I can remember to study, uh, to, ha to have debate. Mm, you don't need these four elements, and yet you can directly uh, uh, touch, uh, attain the true wisdom of the, and you have done what you need to do and you don't return to this world. You do not go through the cycle of birth and death. Do you know if there is any Dharma door that can, that enables you to do this? And so Shariputra, Venerable Shariputra, if you, whatever you have taught, I know, but you haven't taught, then I wouldn't know. It's just like us, whatever our teacher told us, whatever we've read, then we know. But if we've never heard or seen, then we don't know. The Venerable Shariputra was very smart, but he wasn't sure. So he just said that just to make sure. And so the Buddha said, we'd be on the safe side. And so the Buddha said, There's this, when there is anger, hatred, or ignorance, craving, you know that there is um, this craving, hatred, and, and ignorance. And if you don't have that, you know. 
when this awareness, it doesn't need you to have faith, it doesn't need asceticism or of, uh, to study. Do you need to do those things? And uh, Sura Sariputra said, no, no. It's just simply that when you have craving, anger, or ignorance, you know that there is such thing. And if there is a, when it doesn't exist, you know that it doesn't exist in that moment. And the Buddha said, that is the Dharma practice. That is a way, a way of meditation. And with this uh, practice, with this observation, you can right in this moment in here, you can attain arahatship, the highest understanding. You don't have to return to the cycle of birth and death. Anybody who practices like this, you will know that birth and death have ended. Whatever you need to do, you have achieved. You don't need to be reborn in this world anymore. And so when you look at this sutra, look at the foundation and see that our the basics of our practice, we see that even though the Buddha taught for 45 years uh, to lead all these uh, practitioners to attain enlightenment, even if we have all these uh, canons, collections of teachings, even though in China they developed all these different Dharma doors, immediate enlightenment, slow enlightenment, etc., but it all came from the same stream, from this one sutra. Is there any Dharma door? I'm not exaggerating this. I'm not assuming because I've read all the sutras in the Mahayana tradition, in the immediate enlightenment tradition, and I've read uh, teachings in the Nikaya, and I have concluded uh, one important thing is that we practice mindfulness of the body of the four establishments. We look at our breath coming in, coming, going out. We look at our sadness and anger coming in and going out. Um, we look at the stream of consciousness coming and going. Isn't that true that when we are observe that we are observing, we are observing when there is a craving, when there's hatred, when there's uh, ignorance. We know that it is. Is when the mind is spacious, empty, and there is no content, no uh, anger, uh, craving, or, um, or ignorance. But the awareness is always there. It shows that our uh, practice of meditation, it is to build our energy of uh, wisdom that is always there, of insight and and we see the progress like this, the uh, and evolution. We see that the the like the plants or the insects, they they can feel. They know the four, the coming of four seasons. When to fall, their leaves, uh, if we call their consciousness, is much uh, more fragile, and it it can it can feel the insects can or the in, the the. the trees, the plants, they have feeling, but they cannot move. And then there are animals, they can also have their awareness a little more uh, developed than the uh, plants. They can have their emotions, their awareness higher than the plants and higher, and they can also move about, and yet their lives are still anchored to survival-based strategies to find food, uh, to, uh, uh, to give birth, to uh, continue. Um, so as human be beings, as human beings, so we can remember, we can think many years before, can remember what we have gone through, This that we have long-term memory to uh, the, the short-term and long-term of uh, a human being is unsurpassed. You can sit here and you can think about 100 years uh, in, the, in the future or 100 years back to the, but if we look uh, according to the capacity in our n autonomic nervous system or in the brain, we have 
it has taken millions of years to have a brain that is this developed, this big, uh, to this developed. And yet, if we if we stop there, then we don't have the highest uh, the 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 because we identify ourselves with our sadness and anger. We see that we are our own thoughts. I think, therefore, I am. That's we just achieve that the highest level we get to in philosophy to become the the to attain the highest understanding, the, the sage to, um, we can get to the level of the philosopher, but we can go further, is that we can think and observe our thinking in another word. In other words, I think that it's not that I am, I exist anymore, but that energy of thinking that is what exists in me, that is I can use to live in life, but I am much greater than my thinking. I am higher, I am deeper, I am more immense than my thinking. It means that I speak... <laughs> at past uh, in, in, uh, in immensity, but I should come back to the simple thing is that uh, if you have sadness and anger, but it's not everything about you, I should, you see that I know I'm aware of that. I think I'm also somebody who's outside of that thinking of that, is, that stream of, uh, of thoughts uh, that is uh, flowing day and night. So when we are able to see this, then when we see that, it doesn't mean we change our face or our complexion, not because you see this, that we are richer than often. No, we're still the same person. But what's wonderful, the, the great gift, is that we can separate ourselves from all that chaos, the, the of feelings and the emotions, uh, depression and uh, dis-ease and all oh, sadness. Oh, yes, I've been sad in the past, but we still don't know that. We don't know that the observer of this sadness is not the sadness. There's a, a, a great difference, like the earth and the sky. If we identify ourselves with the sadness, then we are lost. We are immersed in this Appointment and despair. But if we are an observer, uh, the observer, then the object is further and further apart. The longer we look at it, then it, it, the greater distance it's become. So right here, we see, we re-examine the words of the Buddha, the, the Dharma door, the Buddha taught us is that to go into the four establishments of, uh, of mindfulness. First of all, is to be aware of the breath that is coming in and going out. It uh, may be invisible, but you can feel through your nose. It doesn't have color, yellow, uh, or red. It seems invisible, but if you can see, can feel the breath coming in and going out, then you can see uh, your the sadness and anger, the jealousy, all the different mental states. Uh, they come in and, and, and go out in the same way. And when you can see this is sadness, this is uh, dis-ease, this is uh, uh, despair, then you can see, oh, this is my despair, this is my uh, broken heart. If you can see your broken heart, then what happens? Then you would not be crazy enough to kill yourself because that broken heart is outside of you. It comes and goes. It has birth and death. You know how some people, they are broken hearted many times, but they didn't die. Only crazy ones, you who identify yourself with a broken heart that you kill yourself. But if you lose a love, you find another one. You don't die from it. That's, that's the situation of those people. They just live in life. I, this is, I'm just making a joke, but they just live recklessly. But if we learn the Dharma, if we learn, practice meditation, then you say, this is my emotion, but it's not me. There's not, 
I am sad, I am angry, I am despair. Uh, I, you feel those emotions, but that's not you. But those, oh, that despair, disappointment, they are emotions that are coming and going. They have their birth and death. You look at it and as they flow by the thoughts. Just like the Buddha said, in the mind here, it has been, it has happened in the past and until now. But in the past, I identify myself with it to think I was thinking. That's why I had insomnia. I couldn't sleep at all because it's like a broken beehive. But now if when we practice, we become the seer, the, we watch the observer of what's flowing through, then you are the seer, the observer. The, uh, the observer uh, with the observed, they are not one. And so you separate yourself from that endless stream of thinking. You separate yourself from the uh, storms of emotions, um, the, the disease, the disappointment, the sadness, the broken heart. Uh, so the Buddha taught in brief, when you have craving, anger, ignorance, all you need to do is to recognize it as it is. If we, if I explain it within a language that is closer to you, is it, that when you have sadness, anger, worries, disappointment, uh, broken heart, then just w observe it. See it, that is being born and is dying. It's outside of you. It's not you. You are the mind of observ observation. You are the, that energy of awareness. And if you practice deeper day by day, it also means that save the, your time, your, live with that, to see deeply what's coming and going. See it as a method that can save us from a lot of afflictions, uh, a lot of uneasiness, and it also brings your life into a higher uh, upward direction. And also the, the, the sage, the, the fully enlightened one, taught us this, transmitted this to us for thousands of years now. So in this very life, we can end our afflictions and achieve the highest understanding. If it stops there, that deep, it, if we are wholehearted, de determined, and we don't identify ourselves with those emotions, no to identify ourselves with the with the thoughts the stream of thinking then we will we will realize that there's no there's no sadness or anger uh, or despair that can violate our own life invade our life and our heart will give rise to whole wholesome uh, uh, states of mind such as generosity, as, as offering virtues, they will themselves accompl be accomplished. We don't need to work hard. And and we, lastly, we will see that this, we say to ourselves, this is the last life. I will not be reborn in the cycle of birth and death of suffering anymore. I attain the highest level, just like the bhikshunis in the, in the past. Um, they achieve the highest understanding, highest uh, enlightenment. If you want to live, you breathe in and out, you, you live. And if you want to die, you stop breathing. Done. Exactly 11. Okay, I finished. Simple recognition of our thoughts, feelings, whatever that's arising. It's a practice of simple recognition. Thank you.